Welcome everyone. We are so glad that you are joining us. Dom and I just came off an amazing week at Kids Week. We had kids from kindergarten through grade five filling the sanctuary in Lexington and online and in Foxborough, uh, learning amazing things about God. We learned about confidence. Can you tell us what confidence is? Confidence is learning to see yourself the way God sees you. On day one, we learn that we can have confidence because we are known. On day two, we learn we can have confidence because we belong. We learned on day three that we can have confidence because we are forgiven. And on day four, we learned we can have confidence because we can change. And on our last day together, we learned that we can have confidence because we can make a difference. Our memory verse this week was John 15, 12, and it goes like this. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. You can find out more about our week by watching this video right now. You can find pictures and highlights of this week and all the things that we have going on on our Kids Town website. It's grace.org slash Kids Town. And we hope that you had so much fun at Kids Week this year. And if you missed it, we'll see you next year. See you guys next year. Well, we have a great morning planned for you. This morning, we kick off our new teaching series titled Self-Centered, Center Self. Each week, we're gonna examine a specific theme that we believe will be helpful to spend time reflecting on. Pastor Adam will be walking us through what does an honesty look like as a follower of Jesus. Let's take a moment to connect with God by worshiping together to this next song. Let it fill the sky. 
The first time I climbed into the pool to join a swim team practice, I honestly questioned my own sanity. I'd grown up in the water, I loved the water, but I was not at all prepared for what it meant to be a swimmer. And the first week of practice, which I wasn't aware of when I started, was affectionately known by the swim team as Hell Week. And for me, it was, you know, what at the time felt like an almost overwhelming challenge. I, I knew how to stay afloat but that's about it. You know, I, I didn't know the techniques. I didn't even know what the different uh, swimming strokes were called. I couldn't do a flip turn. I could barely make it from one end of the pool to the other. Uh, uh, for example, my first swim beat, I swam the 100 free, which if you've been watching you know, the Olympics over the last couple of weeks, you, you might've seen. It's four laps of the pool in freestyle. And at about the 80 yard mark, I was so tired that I actually stood up, caught my breath and was promptly disqualified. It turns out apparently you have to swim the whole way without stopping. Who knew? I mean, I, it's ridiculous, but like, I didn't even know that. And I remember thinking at a particularly challenging moment near the beginning of the season that I should just quit. Uh, I, was, I was swimming backstroke. There were people kicking water into my mouth. I felt like I was gonna drown. And, and I remember thinking if I just quit, uh, I could go home and sit on the couch and just watch TV. But by the end of the season, uh, I found I could swim farther than hundred yards. And I found myself wondering if I could actually, and I say it specifically this way, be a swimmer. Because at this stage, I still didn't really consider myself a swimmer. I was, at least in my mind, I was a guy who had survived a year on the team. But when I looked around at everybody else, I didn't feel like I measured up to the long-term athletes that I saw around me. That said, I had been through what was for me at this stage of my life a difficult season. I had survived it. And because of that, I found myself starting to really think and dream differently about myself and about my future. Uh, the last couple of years, I think for all of us have been a difficult season. Now on a far larger and more difficult scale than a, you know, a season on a sports team, but they've left us with a lot of the same questions, concerns, and even dreams. Uh, the world has changed. Right, totally changed in so many different ways. And we have all of these new questions uh, about things like work uh, or childcare or friendship or, or our well being. Uh, studies are, are showing right now that upwards of 40% of the American workforce is thinking about quitting their jobs and making major life changes. We've had more than a year and a half to sit and to think and to kind of reassess things like work-life balance or our chosen careers. And, and so many of us are ready to make a huge change. Uh, economists are actually calling it the great resignation. So what about you? Uh, has your world been upended? Have you found yourself in this last season rethinking your life? Uh, if so, you're not alone because this is often what a difficult season of life does to us. 
All right? Seasons like this force us to look deeply at our own values, our habits, and, and at our own identity ourselves. And in reassessing ourselves and our futures, we're forced to recenter our lives around new values, around new habits, and around new identities. So what we're going to do as a church and as a community is we are going to spend the next five weeks preparing ourselves for the future. We're going to look backwards at an ancient Christian habit that we believe will help us prepare ourselves for the future. And we're going to spend time as we do this looking back at the ancient Israelite Psalms as we examine our hearts through that lens. And as we do all of this, we're going to ask this question. We're going to ask, are we self-centered or are we centered selves? And lastly, we're going to do it very practically because we're going to do it with a tool that followers of Jesus have been using to recenter their lives around Jesus and the way of Jesus for the last 500 years. It's something called the prayer of examine or uh, the daily examine. And it's this ancient Christian practice of reflective prayer. And the persistent habit of living into this prayer allows us to do some, some really neat things. It, it helps us to hear God the Father's voice. It allows us to recognize Jesus' presence within our daily life and what we're doing. And it helps us to discern the direction of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Uh, it's something that was first outlined by Ignatius Loyola in the 16th century. And it's still practiced by countless Christians today, which, which is amazing. So we, as a community, are going to start practicing it today. And as we do it, we are going to focus on a different aspect of a heart centered on Jesus and the ways of Jesus each week. So what I'm asking you is this, simply, I'm asking you to join us for the next five weeks as we prepare ourselves for the next 47. So we'll come back to my question about whether I could become a swimmer or not later, but, but I wanna take us first to a man in crisis. This is a major crisis. It's a crisis of identity and loss. It's a crisis of his own making, and it's a difficult season that changed him dramatically. So where we're going to go today is we're going to go to Psalm 51. Uh, if you haven't spent much time in the Psalms, they are the hymnal of the ancient Israelites. These are songs and poems that were used by the ancient nation of Israel to worship God. And they express, as you flip through them and read them, a wide range of viewpoints, experiences, and emotions. Uh, some of them are anonymous, and some of them actually have a recorded author. Uh, the one that we're looking at today is famous, not only because of the recorded author, but because of the background of its creation. So let's look at how Psalm 51 opens today, because the opening is fascinating and, and it's critical. It just says this. It says, for the choir director, a psalm of David regarding the time Nathan the prophet came to him after David committed adultery with Bathsheba. That's an interesting way to open, isn't it? Uh, think about it for a second. We don't often sing songs in worship services about moral failure, let alone songs about our own personal moral failure. Uh, imagine, imagine writing something like this for one of our worship leaders about a situation in your own life, giving it to them and saying, I'd like the whole church community to sing about this? Would you have the courage? Now, now imagine you were in leadership and not just leadership, but you are the leader. You're the king because that's who David is. David's the king. He's in charge. He, he leads the nation politically, militarily, and spiritually. And he writes this psalm for the whole nation to participate in. All right, so what's the story? Let me catch you up real quick. The story, it's pretty dark. Uh, David had many wives, which was the custom at the time, especially for kings, but he found himself wanting another man's wife. And not just any man's wife, one of his closest companions, a, a man named Uriah. There was a time before this, a, a time in which David was not king, that there was another man named Saul who was the king. And Saul was so jealous of David's popularity that he tried to kill him. So David had to go in hiding, and a group of men formed around him, and they went into hiding with him. They protected him. They fought with him. They suffered with him. They died for him, and they were called the mighty men of David. And Uriah is one of these mighty men. So David finds himself wanting Uriah's wife, his friend's wife, the man who had sacrificed for him. And he doesn't just want her. He actually has her brought to him while Uriah is away at war fighting for him 
and he has an affair with her. And before we forget, based on kind of the way that we view relationships today, let's not forget that this is a patriarchal society, a highly patriarchal society. So this woman in Bathsheba has very little power at this point in history. Her husband is away. He's away at war fighting for David himself, and the most powerful man in the country comes to her and makes demands of her. And then he tries to cover it up. But Uriah, when he returns, is an honorable man. It's an incredible story, and he won't fall into the cover-up. So what does David do? David has him killed. If you're keeping track at home, that's five out of the 10 commandments broken in one horrible, abusive endeavor. And it might have stayed quiet if God hadn't intervened. Uh, you can read the whole story in 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12. But basically what happens is God sends a prophet named Nathan to challenge David on the whole thing. Now, again, try to put yourself in David's shoes. What, what would you do in this situation? I think many people would say, well, you know, in for a penny, in for a pound, right? You, you've already done all of this stuff, and Nathan's going to blow the lid on it, and you might have Nathan killed as well. But the living word of God, spoken through the prophet Nathan, challenging David, actually convicts him to the deep core of his being, and he not only repents to David, the prophet and to God, but he does so publicly in front of the whole nation. And it's not just an outward apology. David's whole world is upended at this moment. He goes through one of the darkest seasons of his life. Uh, this episode in David's life leads to conflict, pain, and death for him and his whole family. And as a poet and, you know, an artist, he actually puts this pain down on the page in a remarkable way. And his response, I think, has so much to teach us today. So with that background, let's look at Psalm 51 and read together. He says this. He says, Have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love. Because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sin. Wash me from my guilt. Purify me from my sin. Okay, these first two lines, if you're following along in a Bible of your own or a Bible app, highlight them, circle them, do something, write the word imperative next to it. Because from a grammatical standpoint, the, uh, the grammar that's being used here is something called an imperative. It's a command. All right, so a king is used to giving commands, but, but we do this all the time in our, in our own world. You might say to somebody, do your homework or clean up your room, or, or as my four-year-old says to me at almost every meal, bring me my milk cup. And I always have to have a conversation with him. Okay, can we try that again? Can you ask nicely, this and that? But that's what this is. This is strong language being used. Uh, the thing about it, though, is David isn't commanding God. He's begging him. And he's doing so in the strongest possible language. Picture David. At this stage, he's been long in his kingship. He is long accustomed to giving orders. He is long accustomed to saying things in the imperative. He might not have been able to phrase it that way, but he gives commands and people follow. He says jump and they say how high. And picture him here on his knees, begging God for mercy, and you will have found the right tone for this passage. Uh, have you ever screwed up so badly you have begged someone for forgiveness? If so, you're not alone. And David writes about it here. So he then goes on to clarify and articulate his reasons for begging for God's mercy. He says this, For I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. Against you and you alone I have sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. You will be proved right in what you say, and your judgment against me is just. For I was born a sinner, yet from the moment my mother conceived me. But you desire honesty from the womb, teaching me wisdom even there. He's doing something interesting here. He is framing what just happened as a sin against God alone. And he's publicly acknowledging that this sin stretches back way before this present situation, that it's a habit and a lifetime of sin. Now, this is not... It's not a case of him covering up. He's not trying to say, I didn't do anything to Bathsheba and Uriah. Instead, it's against God because... Everybody knows about it, right? If, if he hands them this thing and, and talks about this horrible sin against God, people are going to say, well, what was the sin? You know, so it's out there. It's public. It, it's there. But what he is saying is that the first and primary judge of our actions is God himself. And David isn't making any excuses. Don't miss that. He's not making any excuses here. He is pleading in front of the judge guilty. And then he's falling 
on God's mercy. He says this, purify me from my sins and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Oh, give me back my joy again. You have broken me. Now let me rejoice. Don't keep looking at my sins. R remove the stain of my guilt. And then this, this really famous passage here, he says, create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit in me. Do not banish me from your presence and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. This, this comment here about the Holy Spirit, it's often, I think, misunderstood, at least by me when I was younger. I always used to worry that you know, if I sinned or if I did something, you know, God was going to walk away from me and leave me alone. And that's not what he's saying. He is actually referring to the anointing of the Holy Spirit over his kingship. He's not saying that God abandons us when we sin. He's not saying that God takes his presence away from us. He is recognizing that God took the anointing as king away from his predecessor, Saul. And David is asking God to not do it to him in this moment. The thing, though, is the difference between Saul and David is stark. So let's look back at the moment that David is referring to. It comes from 1 Samuel 15. Uh, Saul is the king at the time, like I mentioned, and he had been given clear instructions by God, by the prophet Samuel, on how to conduct an upcoming battle. And this is what happens when Samuel went to see what happened. It says, early the next morning, Samuel went to find Saul. Someone told him Saul went to the town of Carmel to set up a monument to himself. Then he went on to Gilgal. Okay, don't miss the comment about setting up a monument to himself. When Samuel finally found Saul, he greeted him cheerfully. May the Lord bless you, he said. I have carried out the Lord's command. Now, this, this wasn't true. I mean, at least not completely true. God had actually told Saul through Samuel to destroy all of the livestock, but he hadn't. And Samuel, with what sounds like a bit of sarcasm, says this. He asks, then what is all the bleeding of sheep and goats and the lowing of cattle I hear? Ooh. So what does Saul do when confronted by a prophet? Does he fess up here or does he double down with excuses? Well, this is what he says. He said, oh, it's true that the army spared the best of the sheep, the goats, and the cattle, Saul admitted, but they're going to sacrifice them to the Lord your God. We have destroyed everything else. All right, you can, you can finish up the rest of the story in, in 1 Samuel 15, but to make a long story short, when confronted with sin, Saul made excuses. He refused to take responsibility. And he continues to do this throughout the rest of his kingship. I mean, th there are times when he will apologize or beg for forgiveness, but it's always very self-serving. And don't miss the fact that he says, the Lord, your God. Uh, David, on the other hand, he confesses everything and he begs for forgiveness. And then he asks for restoration. And here's what he says. He says, restore to me the joy of of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. He's asking God to, to change him from the inside out and make him willing to obey God, which is fascinating. And then he says, then I will teach your ways to rebels and they will return to you. Uh, forgive me for shedding blood, O God who saves. Then I will joyfully sing of your forgiveness. Unseal my lips, O Lord, that my mouth may praise you. Then he says this, and with that past story from, from uh, Saul saying that he's going to you know, keep all these animals to sacrifice them and this and that, read this with, with that memory in light. He says, you do not desire a sacrifice or I would offer one. You do not want a burnt offering. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. And then this beautiful line, he says, you will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O God. All right, we're going to stop here. There's a couple more verses if you want to finish it out. But I want to focus on these last two lines because there are clear parallels in the stories of these two kings. The king had disobeyed. A prophet brings it to their attention and the kings respond. Saul, with excuses and with references to the Lord your God. David, with a broken-hearted confession, repentance, and a desperate desire for the Lord his God to draw near. Saul with self-deception and self-interest. David with an honest assessment of himself that actually centers his heart and his identity on God instead of himself. David shows us that, an, uh, that a heart centered on God 
is honest. Any journey towards health starts with an honest acknowledgement of where you're at emotionally, physically, and spiritually. I mean, if, if you've been in counseling like I have, you know that you only make progress when you are honest with the counselor and with yourself. Now, God in his goodness, he does not want us to stay hidden. He doesn't want us to stay in our brokenness. So we can't move forward. We can't center ourselves on Jesus until we're honest with where we are. Because honesty confronts shallow pretension and self-centered living. Uh, both kings faced difficult and dark seasons after these moments, but they faced them differently. They reacted to God's word in their lives differently, and they came out the other side very different men. So how will we as a church community come out on the other side of this difficult season? How will you as a person come out the other side? Well, I think it depends on how we face what we're going through. And it depends on how we react to the word of God in our lives. Will you make excuses and center your worldview on yourself and what you want? Or will you face the future with an honest self-assessment and a heart that is centered on Jesus? If you're willing to join the Holy Spirit in a daily honest reflection, then your life will begin to change. Uh, back to my opening story about becoming a swimmer. You know, I had a choice to make after that first season on the team. I could have said it was too difficult. I'd never reached the lofty heights of my teammates and I could have, um, I guess, hung up my towel. <laughs> I don't know how to phrase it, but, or I could have leaned into the habits, the rhythm, and the coaching that would turn me into a swimmer. We have similar questions in front of us right now. So as a church, what we're gonna do is we are going to spend the fall learning and practicing new habits and rhythms that will transform us if we let them. Before we get there, we need to spend the next five weeks preparing our hearts for a season of transformation. And as I mentioned, we're gonna use a tool that followers of Jesus have used for 500 years in the daily prayer of examine. And each week we will use that tool to focus on a different aspect of a healthy heart. And we're gonna use this prayer to help us center our hearts around this aspect. So this week we start with honesty. The first step towards health and a heart centered on Jesus is honesty. And my strong, strong encouragement to you is to commit to making this a habit for the next five weeks. Repetition creates clarity. Uh, we can't do something like this just once. We can't just sit back and watch it happen once and expect it to stick. Uh, we all know that habits take time and repetition. So we have a few tools to help you. Uh, if you've come physically to one of our campuses, we have a bookmark that outlines the five steps we're about to walk through. Uh, but you can also find it digitally in our app. Uh, go download the app and turn on notifications and you'll get an update each week to remind you. Lastly, you can look for a full PDF of the instructions uh, at grace.org under resources or in our e-news. So I'm going to pray for us before we practice this habit for the first time. And here's what I'm going to ask. If you're willing, would you take your hands and would you hold them palm up in front of you or in your lap as an outward sign of an inward reality? Uh, we're saying to God that we are ready and willing to accept whatever it is he's about to show us. Let's pray together. Lord God, I thank you for the story and illustration of both Saul and David. There's so much brokenness and so much pain there, but the way that they each responded offers us a, a very different path forward. So Lord, I ask for our congregation, for those who are listening, for those who found us online for the first time today. Lord, would you bring about an honest assessment in our lives? Would you let us look deep into our own heart with the power of the Holy Spirit and with this prayer that we are about to walk through? And would you speak to us and allow us to move forward out of a place of honest self-assessment? Help us in these next five weeks to really center ourselves, to recenter ourselves, become centered selves that are, that are following you, that are following the way of Jesus and following Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We ask this in his name and his power. Amen. All right, so we're going to walk through the prayer of examine together. 
Uh, traditionally, there are five easy movements to the prayer, and there's, there's traditional language around it, but we actually we found a, a version that we liked that used five R's that were easy to remember. And at the end, I will um, just do a quick tag for where you can find that and where it came from. But I'm going to lead us through each one in turn and give you a bit of space to reflect. So let's just start with this. Let's start with a few deep centering breaths, reminding yourself that you are in the presence of God. We start by relishing the good moments. Take a minute or so and ask yourself, what are you thankful for in the last day? Allow both the big and the small things to come to mind. You know, everything from your family to your lunch to hitting so many green lights today on your way in. After we've spent time relishing the good, the next thing we do is we request God's help. We're about to review our past day, and in order to learn and grow, we can't do so without help. So ask the Holy Spirit to guide your review, uh, to lean you or lead you towards what he wants you to see, and keep God's will as the focus of your prayer. You know, without this, we can often succumb to the temptation or the tendency to make the prayer about us. So let's ask, and request help from God. All right, now we're gonna review your day. Look through your last 24 hours hour by hour, if you need, looking for places where God was with you, uh, places where you followed Jesus well or times you didn't. And sp uh, pay special attention to your emotional response to the events of your day. Uh, these can be clues to God's movement in your life. You know, what were the significant emotions in the day that came up from events and how might God be speaking to you through these emotions? Continue to ask the Holy Spirit to guide you and try to avoid denial or intense recrimination. As you're walking through that day, you want to repent of any mistakes. I mean, there's, there's, there's two different kinds. If, if you've knowingly sinned, which I've done more times than I can count, ask God for forgiveness. If you've unintentionally made a mistake, which, which we all do, ask God for wisdom and how to repair that mistake, how to learn from it, and how to avoid it in the future. And as you do this, as you repent from mistakes, ask God for healing for yourself and for others involved. Finally, after you've walked through the whole thing, resolve to live tomorrow well. 
choose one piece of wisdom you've received from the Holy Spirit and resolve in a concrete way to live that out the following day. Then walk, you know, quickly in your mind through the following day, focusing on any challenging moments that are coming and ask for strength and wisdom for those moments. Finally, as we close, take a few more deep centering breaths and thank God for this time together. Lord God, we want to thank you for this opportunity. I want to thank you for this simple tool that allows us to make an honest assessment of our own lives. A simple tool that allows us to see where you've been interacting with us, where you've been leading us, where you've been prompting us. A, a place where we can make decisions on how to live tomorrow differently in your power. So we thank you for this and I ask would you continue to use this in us over the next five weeks? Would our hearts be ready for the fall? and for a new and different path. In the name of Jesus, amen. So I let us do that, I think, maybe a little more quickly than you'd want to do it yourself, but you, know, you can take the time that you need. I would just encourage you to choose one time each day to practice this simple and short prayer. Maybe right before bed, or maybe it's the first thing you do in the morning when you wake up, going through the last day, and then deciding you know, what you're going to do today. But I'd ask you to commit to it for the next five weeks. Uh, you know, giving yourself grace if you forget or if things come up, but just see what God does in your life and through you in the lives of others. Uh, to find more variations on this prayer, you can download the app Reimagining the Examine. Uh, that's where those five R's came from. It's on the App Store or the Google Play Store, but you can also just go straight to our app and we've got the information there for you on the one we just walked through. You know, any journey towards health starts with an honest assessment of where you are emotionally, physically, and spiritually. And the first step towards health and a heart centered on Jesus is honesty. So let's spend the next week continually asking God to help us honestly assess where we are as we anticipate growth and change in the future. Amen. Sh 
show Christ in all I do. Holy Spirit from creation's birth, giving life to all that God has made. Oh, oh show your power once again on earth. Cause your church to hunger for your ways. Let the fragrance of on the road of sacrifice that in unity the face of Christ will be clear for all the world to see will be clear for all the world to see It is our hope that throughout this series you will take time to utilize the Reimagining the Examine app. This is a great tool to leverage the prayer of Examine throughout the week. One quick event to be aware of is our One Church Night of Worship. It will be happening at our Foxborough campus on Saturday, August 21st at 7 p.m. To learn more about the specifics of this event, please visit our website at grace.org events. And thanks again for being with us this morning, friends. And we hope that you have a great week.